Hey, let's continue with um, the three major pole in Greece uh, during the Archaic period, which is approximately 1000 to 400 BCE. Um, we talked a little about Athens, the spirit of democracy, and now I'd like to talk about Sparta. Sparta was located, look at your map, uh, let's see, page 90 in volume 20, I don't know, but if you look at, we noticed that Athens was on Attic, which was very rugged and rocky, difficult to farm. Sparta is just the opposite. It's on a place, a Greek island called Peloponnesus. And if you look at it, um, you will see that unlike Athens, which is craggy and rocky and hilly, uh, Sparta, there was the opportunity to do a lot of um, farming and real agriculture. And Sparta was formed by four, um, four cities, if you will, uh, coming together. And in order to do so, they actually created a situation where they had um, where they had two major families, so they had two kings, actually. The lineage of Sparta is kind of interesting because they're going to actually have in power or control two different kings, uh, which is kind of interesting for them um, and for us to observe. Now, a couple of things we have to note is that Sparta, unlike Athens, had nobody to write down their history. It sort of reminds us of whom? Like the uh, Philistine in um, the Middle East. So the story is written by the Hebrews. And in this case, the story of Sparta is in Peloponnesus is often written by the Athenians. So you kind of have to put it in your head, like who's writing it? Is there prejudice there, etc. Okay, um, so Sparta throughout its whole history is going to have this dual monarchy, if you will. These two ruling families, they're gonna have this dual monarchy. Uh, two royal families and two lines of succession. Um, seniority, meaning age and experience, generally between the two, evidently, is going to uh, influence who's going to be in control. Um, so Spartan control over that whole area, which you see in your map of Laconia, all that area in the south of Peloponnesus was quite important because that is the farmland. So Sparta is going to take over this agriculturally rich territory in approximately 720 BCE. In doing so, all the people that live there are gonna become its slaves and they're going to be called helots or helots, H-E-L-O-T-S. And they're gonna become the unfree population forced to work under Spartan uh, leaders, of course, and around 650, the Helots are going to revolt, um, and they're going to get support from a lot of the neighboring pole, and that's going to just briefly threaten the Spartans. It's not going to work, but it's going to threaten them and probably give them some insight into what can happen if they give up power. Um, I just want to say about this... Um, that um, in most civilizations, I think we've done this already before, if you were conquered by somebody, colonized, you're definitely part of that slave population or unfree population. Okay, so Sparta, therefore, after that brief period of revolt and rebellion, was determined never to have another uprising and to protect its... Uh, leaders and its position in the um, in the Greek islands. Why was it superior? Well, largely because it had all this agriculture. It could be self-sustaining. Athens certainly could not. Um, and in order to remain this way, Sparta is going to become the most militarized polis in all of Greece, at least according to the writers we read. Within a few generations, everything was oriented towards maintenance of a hoplite army, a citizen army, if you will. And um, this was a force that was way superior to any other polis, Athens, any other polis 
anywhere in uh, the Greek islands. Um, and Sparta, because this um, uh, military, hoplite army, if you will, was so powerful, they didn't even need to have fortifications. They didn't have a citadel. They didn't have a wall over their island. They just scared people away by the force of their military. Um, they could leave it unfortified. Um, at just the same time, Athens is becoming more democratic. Uh, you know, the transition from Dracon to Solon to Cleisthenes, you know, opening up to the polis. Um, Sparta is becoming more and more, um, you know, devoted to the old order of aristocracy, towards warfare, and permitting less and less per personal freedom um, in order to bolster the collective security of the polis. So let's talk about the Spartan system. What is, you know, what does it look like? Um, Sparta was kept itself very isolated, closed off. Um, every male citizen, every male citizen uh, born to somebody in Sparta became a professional soldier of the phalanx. At birth, every Spartan child was examined by officials who determined whether he was healthy enough to raise. This is sad. If not, uh, if the child had some disability or was not healthy enough, he was abandoned in the mountains. Now, this was a custom observed elsewhere in the ancient world, I know, uh, but only in Sparta was it instituted by the state. Like in other places, it just sort of families employed it and other people, but, you know, that's what happened. Um, boys and girls trained together until age 12. Uh, they participated in exercise, gymnastics, other physical drills, and competitions. Boys would then go to live, age 12, in the barracks where their military, military training would begin. Um, and girls continued training until they became eligible at the age of 18 um, to, um, you know, have children and begin to um, propagate families and babies. Now, Spartan males, usually when the girls were around the age of 18 and were ready to make families, the men were often older um, for most of their married lives. Because why? Because the men at that age were going into warfare or into the hoplite army. The barracks life were rigorous, designed to make the youths uh, confront physical hardship, etc. And at age 18, young men who went into this training uh, would try for membership in one of the elite uh, military units. Um, and you, um, and if you didn't gain acceptance into the um, one of these groups, elite military groups, you were actually at risk of losing your citizenship in Sparta. So obviously everybody had the incentive to try to do their best. If accepted, you would remain in the brotherhood, whatever it was, until approximately age 30, uh, 20 and 30. And then you were expect to mate with a Spartan woman. Um, and actually, why? Because they would try to get the population up. But it actually did not work out because uh, between 20 and 30, either many men had been killed or many didn't want to mate with women, um, and therefore they had a very low birth rate among Spartan citizens. So that um, at age 30, a Spartan could opt to go live with his family, but he was still required to remain on active military duty until he was 60. Now, all kinds of variations of this exist all over the world today in military. Some people remain on active duty until age 60 uh, in some militaries of the world. Other people, uh, for example, in the old Soviet Union used to be sent to special schools to be trained in the military or gymnastics or some other specialty. Um, and all 
Okay, so it's pretty interesting. All Spartan males over the age of 30 were members of a citizen's assembly in Appella, A-P-E-L-L-A. That sounds like a cappella. Yes, it was an independent group. Uh, and these people voted on uh, matters, you know, that were proposed by the city council, uh, Gerusia, um, or the assembly of elders, and they consisted of 28 senior citizens and the two kings. This Gerusia was the main policy making body of the polis and also its court system. Um, the members were elected for life, but um, you had to be over 60 before you could stand for office. Um, so, um, excuse me one second. Of course, this had to go off. Um, and in the meantime, there were five overseers who were elected, you know, every year, and they supervised stuff like the educational system, guardians of the Spartan tradition. Now, many people, um, and those a force, by the way, could remove an ineffectual king or, you know, uh, promote the best Spartan soldiers or put them in the secret service or spy missions. Uh, but their main job was to infiltrate the Halot population uh, and to identify any troublemakers. Um, the Spartan polity, if you will, or polis, hinged on the relationship with the Halots, you know, the people who they had taken over. And they outnumbered the Spartans 10 to 1. Um, they're routinely in that area of southern uh, Peloponnesus going to revolt. Uh, and in wartime, sometimes the Halots um, um, would be put down, the revolts would be put down. And so the government, the Gerusia, the um, Appella, and the A4, had to be careful about which Halots they allowed to fight for Sparta because uh, they were always revolting against the leadership in the uh, country. Something like, I don't know, your book says like every year the Spartans declared war on them and there was this constant state of unrest, which is not great, right? And a constant state of instability where the government could be threatened at any time. So Halot slavery, if you will, um, and hoplite, action on the part of the Halites made the Spartan system possible. Um, but of course, as we know, most dictatorships, the reliance on a sort of hostile group is not going to make for a lot of stability. Um, the Spartan system also isolated itself, limited itself, limited its contact with the outside world. Uh, they were not uh, permitted to engage in commerce uh, because wealth and freedom might distract them from the pursuit of military or martial glory. Uh, nor did the Spartans farm their own land, of course. The Halots did it. Uh, the slaves did it. Um, or the free residents of other Peloponnesian cities uh, did it. The dwellings around them. Perikai. Um, so the Spartan system grew wealthy, man managing their land, um, allowing the others in Peloponnesus to trade, and um, made sure that the farmers, the um, Paraguay, had no political um, rights as citizens, uh, nor did the Halots. Um, they rejected innovation, they called themselves protectors of traditional Greek customs, a beautification of the man, um, natural um, guest friendships, a warlike uh, prowess. These were all things. And of course, and respect for the ancestors. So Sparta's extreme defense of the Greek world and tradition in the Greek world, although it was admired elsewhere, in um, the ancient and golden age of Sparta, very few people wanted to move to Sparta and live a life like that. 
Um, of course, the fatal flaw is what, as your book points out, demographic. Um, there were a lot of ways to fall from grace in Sparta. There was a low birth rate. Um, and as a result, the number of full Spartans, or Spartiates as they call themselves, declined from about 10,000 in the 7th century to only about 1,000 uh, by the middle of the 4th century. Another flaw, of, whereas let's just make this comparison, remember we thought we were dealing between 10 and 20,000 uh, free Athenians in the Deimos, and they stayed. They were, in fact... Um, population growing. They didn't have enough room for them, so they went and colonized along the coastland uh, in the Mediterranean. The Spartans, of course, are going to shrink to less than 1,000 by 350, the fourth century. And another is that because the Spartans put little value on reading, writing, intellectual life, historical records, they didn't write anything. They didn't write their own history or pass it down. So Sparta had trouble a lot of the ways. Finally, you've probably heard the expression today, he lives somewhat of a Spartan life, meaning his whole life is um, pretty crude, not filled with decoration or frills. It's just pretty crude, just the basics. And of course, in Sparta, that was the soldier's life, to live very Spartan. Just meet those needs you have. Okay, finally, before I end today, uh, let's talk about Miletus. Look at your map again, and Miletus is on what is called Ionian, Ionia, in Ionia, on the Ionian coast. Ionia means Greek, uh, and it's on the Greek coast or mainland of Turkey. Um, even though they saw themselves as Greeks, uh, they were on the coast of Anatolia, which at that time was being taken over by the Persians. And from what we know, the individuals in Ionia wanted desperately to hold on to their Greek, their Greek uh, traditions, education, etc. Um, it had long been a part of the Greek world, probably because of trade. It had been shaped also, as you know, by Mesopotamia and Egyptian influence. So it really had a hybrid of cultures, like a lot of different kinds of people. Persians, Egyptians, Mesopotamians. Um, it produced interesting and important art forms, different ways of thinking. And of course, because it was a hodgepodge, uh, sort of like New York or San Francisco or another port city. It had a lot of creativity. And the relationship between Ionian Greeks, if you will, and the Persians um, um, was at times tense and at times fine. Ionia was absorbed into the Persian Empire in the 6th century, the 500s, uh, but they wanted to maintain their own culture. And it was the Ionians, if you look at it carefully, that uh, represented Lydia. And remember, Lydia is the king who brought the Greek world coinage, gold, coinage. Um, and it revolutionized trade all over the world by making trade. What did finding coinage do or using coinage? It made trade portable. In other words, you could use the coins as representative of the products, finally. So ultimately, the Ionians are going to play a very critical role in developing the colonization of the Greeks. Um, and the major poli of Ionian, you'll see it's uh, Miletus, Sardis, Phrygia, all kinds of different places banded together and they formed what would become known as the Ionian League, a political and cultural organization or confederation. Um, this was the first such organization that we'd seen, a federation. And why did they do it? In order to check Persian power from coming into Ionian, Ionia. Um, the Milesians, therefore, formed colonies, colonies, especially in and around the Black Sea. Look at where that is. Um, and um, it also, so, you know, these colonial efforts, and also if you combine that with the perfect position they were to trade both in the Mediterranean, on the mainline, and in the Black Sea area, uh, brought them extraordinary wealth. 
Um, it also became a, um, it became a, um, a center for um, wealth, speculative thinkings, and what we're going to call philosophia, the love of wisdom. And beginning in the 6th century, therefore the 500s, a lot of intellectuals or thinkers, now known, we call them today the pre-Socratic thinkers, because they came uh, to be near and to learn from the great uh, thinker Socrates. And they raised questions about the relationship between their world and the natural world, uh, the cosmos, gods, men, um, and often their influence began to influence everything that the Ionians and also further afield the Greeks uh, were doing. So they're slowly going to, of course they'll never be accepted, this kind of speculative thinking in Sparta, but in Athens they begin to uh, nurture each other's thoughts and um, they're going to build, these Milesian philosophers, lovers of wisdom, are going to uh, build on earlier traditions of, you know, Babylonian mathematics, astronomy, uh, but of course they're going to raise more uh, complications and change the thinking a little bit and allow them to sort of rethink their place in the cosmos. Um, so I guess you could say that they're going to revolt against the narrow view of most of the pole in the Greek universe and open them up. Uh, they're going to study the customs, beliefs of all of human knowledge and other cultures. A man named Xenophon uh, said that all knowledge is relative and conditioned by human experience. He said for example, that the Thracians people living in the north of Greece believed that gods had blue eyes and red hair, just like them, whereas Ethiopians portrayed gods as dark-skinned and curly-haired, just as they were. So he concluded, you can imagine how dangerous this was to many people, that human beings always made gods in their own image, not the other way around. If horses could fashion images of their god, Xenophane argued, the gods would look like horses. So let's just think about that for a while. That's interesting. So these and other theories formed a distinctive strand in Greek philosophy. Um, but like most intellectuals and new ways of thinking, they would be regarded as disturbing, dangerous, sometimes threatening. Uh, and we'll see, because do you know what happens to Socrates? He's going to be executed, and we'll see why. It was truly this kind of um, threat that he posed to uh, the way of thinking in Greece. Um, let's say they would, um, the struggle between religion and philosophy is ultimately going to be fought uh, later after Xenophane dies, um, and by that time Persia had conquered Lydia and made Miletus a sister city, if you will, subject to the empire. Um, and Ionia is going to resist uh, the Greek world um, and try to keep its core, its intellectual, philosophical core. So now you have the um, a character and the beginning of political systems developing uh, between Sparta, Athens, and Miletus. You get a real character of the world as it has changed from the time we moved from Phoenicia, Mesopotamia, the Middle East, to the Greek islands. Uh, don't rest on your laurels yet, of course. We're going to go back in a little bit uh, for Christianity, Judaism, etc. Okay. Um, the next section of this chapter is on, of course, the most interesting, something called the greatest war in history, the Peloponnesian War, which is where Sparta and Athens are going to go at each other. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk too much 
about the golden age of classical Greece, other than the philosophers. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly in the next um, next visit. I'll give you a couple days to sort of ruminate on this, catch up with your reading, and do your assignment. Uh, otherwise, stay self, stay healthy and wise. Okay.